Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazan, and today is 21st December 2021. Right now, I am with the 11 Cambridge class, and the subject we are studying is Cambridge O Levels of Physics 5054. Today, we have set our hearts to solve alternative to practical, a paper four. We have selected October, November 2018 for two paper. This paper belongs from the zone two, or you can say, Variant two. Uh, let's start this paper. The time allowed for this paper is uh, two hours. And let's start. Okay. So October, November 2018, four two paper, one hour is allowed, alternative to practical, paper four. A student investigates how the current in a thermistor depends upon temperature. She sets up the circuit shown in the figure 1.1. So here you have your thermistor, here we have a water, here we have water in a beaker, here we have a thermometer, and this uh, thermistor is connected with the, a battery, which is of five volt. Here we have an ammeter. If the resistance of the thermistor will change, then the current coming from the battery will also change. If the resistance will be higher, the current will be lower. If the resistance will be lower, the current will be higher. Okay, she pours hot water into the beaker. She stirs the water, measures its temperature and reads the ammeter. She records the values of temperature and current in the table of the figure 1.2. She repeats these readings at 10 degrees centigrade intervals as the water cools until the water reaches room temperature. She records all her readings in the table as shown in the figure 1.2. So here in the figure 1.2, we have two columns. One is the temperature. You can see 80 degrees, 70 degrees. She has poured hot water into this beaker. And when the temperature is 80, she noted down what's the reading on the ammeter. And then when the, the temperature is 70 degree, after 10 degrees centigrade interval, she notes down what's the reading on the ammeter. Okay. So when the temperature is 60, she notes down what's the reading on the ammeter. The reading on the ammeter is in milliamperes. It's not in amperes, it's in milliamperes. Okay, so here at 40 degrees centigrade, what's the, what's the reading on the ammeter? We don't know. Okay, so figure 1.3 shows the ammeter reading when the temperature of the water is 40 degrees centigrade. Okay, so this is how much reading. So let's let's increase the size a little bit so you can see it more clearly. So this is 0 0.5, this is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So this is 0 0.85. The reading is 0 0.85 milliampere. So read the ammeter and record the missing values of current in the table 1.2. So the reading is basically zero point, uh, the reading is how much? This is 0 0.85, 0 0.85 milliampere. So the reading is 0 0.85 milliampere. Let me show you. I've done this, okay. So here we go. 0 0.85 milliampere. This is how you will record the reading in this table. Okay, so uh, the next question. State why the student stirs the water before taking a temperature reading. You see the water is hot and she has put a thermometer. So there can be uh, many reasons. One of the reasons is that she wants to make sure that the whole water has a uniform temperature. Another reading, another reason can be she, she, she let the, the, the temperature and the thermometer get that temperature. Okay, so uh, let me show you my answer. Okay. So to ensure that water is at a uniform temperature, to ensure that the water is at a uniform temperature. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, so here we go. On the figure 1.4, plot a graph of I on the y-axis against theta on the x-axis. Start both the axes from the origin. Draw the smooth curve of the best fit. So the table, I will be on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we will have the theta temperature. Theta means temperature. And this is the table whose graph we are going to draw. This is the table. So this is the readings for the x-axis and these are their y-axis values. So these are kind of coordinates, okay? So let me show you how I did this. The, the temperature values and the reading on the, on the x-axis, they are changing from, um, uh, from 20 to 80. The reading on the y-axis, which is current, is changing from 0.45 to 2.90, okay. So, okay, so, so this is, you see this, I have labeled, I have labeled the, the grid, the axis. So on the x-axis, I have temperature, theta, in degree centigrade. On the y-axis, I have current, I, in milliamperes. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2.0, 2.5, 3.0. .0. .0. Okay, then I will plot those points. And those points are these points at 20, 0 0.45, at 30, 0 0.6, at 40, 0 0.85, at 50, 1.2, at 60, 1.75, at 70, 2.30, at 80, 2.90. So, so I have plotted those points here. So you can see those points. You can also plot them on your graph. And then I have tried to join them with a smooth curve. Okay, it's a four mark question. Okay, so then the question is, let's have a look at the question, what the question is. They say, draw that graph. We have drawn that graph. And then their question is, extend your curve to predict the current for the temperature of zero degrees centigrade. So when the current is zero degrees centigrade. Suggest how the student can modify her investigation to check the prediction made in the C first part. Okay. So the graph is up till here. And in the sm same smoothness, I have taken this, I have prolonged it till this point. So from here at zero degree temperature, the current will be um, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 uh, milliampere. So my prediction is 0 0.2 milliampere. Uh, to show the millimeter of the length. Okay, um, so when the temperature is zero, okay, when the temperature is zero, this reading is, I think, if this is 0 0.1, this will be 0 0.2. So the reading is 0 0.2. I think the reading is 0 0.2 milliampere. approximately 0 0.25, maybe 0 0.24, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.24, so you can say 0 0.25. Okay, so, so the reading is 0 0.25 milliampere. Suggest how the student can modify her investigation to check the prediction made in the C first part because we have, guess this this current from the graph the graph was not actually at the zero degree centigrade but we just prolonged that graph so we predicted that that when the temperature will be zero this will be the reading on the ammeter so we predicted it so now they say how you can actually do this so what you can do you can take the melting ice 
in the beaker and then do this experiment and check actually what is the reading on the ammeter. So my answer is add melting ice into the water and measure the current. Okay, remember, the question is suggest how the student can modify her investigation to check the prediction made in the C first part. Hopefully you understand what's the meaning of these sentences. He says, use your graph to estimate the current I when the temperature of the water is 75 degree. Okay. So when the temperature is 75, this is the temperature 75 when you go to there. So this reading will be something like 26, I think. So it's not 26, it's 2.6 basically. Okay. So the 2.6 milliampere. So this will be the reading. Okay. So uh, the next question, uh, let me show you from the question paper. Uh, okay. So this is the next question coming up. And he says, suggest how the student can, we are done with that. And then use your graph to estimate, we are done with that. The voltage V of the power supply is five volt. Use the equation. And R is equals to V by I to calculate the resistance R of the thermistor at 75 degrees centigrade. So we know the voltage that is 5 volt and we know the current here, 2.6 uh, ampere. And what we will do, uh, just put these values here and do the calculation. Let me show you. Okay. So R will be equals to V by I, V is five volt and the current is 2.6 expo uh, minus three because the current was in milliamperes, we have converted into the amperes. So uh, it will be 2.6 expo minus three. So in your calculator, you will write five divided 2.6 expo minus three equals to, and the answer will be 1.92 expo three. So move this decimal uh, three steps to the right and the final answer will be 1920 ohm. 1920 ohm. So this is how you find the resistance. Okay, the next part is, he says, um, describe the relationship between the current and the temperature for the thermistor shown by your graph. Okay, so if you look, it's a two mark question. If you look at this graph, as the temperature is increasing, the, uh, the current value is also increasing, but the increase is not uniform. The rate of increase is increasing. The, when you increase the temperature, the current is also increasing, but the, the increase is not uniform. The graph is not a straight line. It's a increasing curve, which means that the, when you increase the temperature, the current is increasing with increasing rate. Okay. So let me show you my answer. So how we have written the answer. So here we go. As the temperature increases, current in the circuit increases at increasing rate. The rate of increase is increasing. Okay, because the, the magnet, you see the gradient of the graph is gradually increasing. It's increasing curve. Then he says, deduce the relationship between the resistance and the temperature of the thermistor. Because you know the current, as the temperature is increasing, the current flowing through the circuit is increasing. This means that when the temperature is increasing, the resistance is, uh, the resistance is decreasing. So uh, here, uh, uh, as deduce the relationship between the resistance and the temperature of the thermistor, as the temperature increases, the resistance decreases, okay? As the temperature increases, the resistance decreases. I have not written that sentence, but, but you can write that. Let me write that. So as the temperature increases, the resistance decreases. How do I know this? As the temperature increases, uh, the current flowing through the circuit increases, which, which is an indicator that the resistance is decreasing, okay? So, because the V value, another way of knowing this is that the V value will, you know, the resistance formula is V by I. So, but the, because the V value is constant and the I value is gradually, uh, gradually increasing. As you increase the temperature, the I value is increasing. It means, 
that the V by I will gradually decrease. So as the temperature increases, the resistance decreases. Okay, so here we go to the next question. Okay, so we are done with the question number one. So I have a look at the marking scheme. So here we have the question number one. It's October November 2018, 4-2 paper. This marking scheme is showing up on your screen. So pause the video and take your time, read this marking scheme carefully, check for every point how much numbers are there. It's very important to always check your answers, compare them with the marking scheme. Okay, so let's go to the next question. A student measures the focal length of a convex lens. He sets up the apparatus shown in the figure 2.1. So here you have an illuminated object. Here's an object, we have a hole in it. Here we have a lamp. So when you will switch on the lamp, it will be illuminated. Here you have a convex lens on a stand. Here you have a screen and uh, the distance between the object, this, this object and the lens is X. The distance between the screen and the lens is Y. He places the lens a distance from the illuminated object. A distance from the illuminated object. He moves the screen until a sharp image of the object is formed on the screen. A first part is measured to the nearest millimeter. The length x and the length y on the figure 2.1. Okay, so with the help of the scale, check what's this distance. Okay, and with the help of the scale, check what is this distance. If you have the hard copy of this paper, by placing your scale here, check how much is this length. And just note down there. Now, um, I've done this, uh, let me show you. Okay. So uh, the X reading is 2.6 centimeter and the Y reading is 7.8 centimeter. Your length might be little less than these readings. The reason is when we photocopy the paper, the diagrams shrink a little bit. So that's why your length will, the X value will not be 2.6. It will be little less than 2.6. Your Y value will be also not 7.8 centimeter. It will be a little less than 7.8 and it's all right. Okay, so the next question, the next part. He says, uh, the diagram in the figure 2.1 is drawn one eighth full scale. It means that if something is on the diagram represented with one centimeter, in actual, it is eight centimeter long. Calculate the distance U from the object to the lens, and that is X in our diagram. U is the distance of the object from the lens and the distance V from the image to the lens. So you can find the U by multiplying whatever is the value of X with eight. And you can multiply, you can find the value of the V by multiplying the value of Y with eight because the scale is one ratio eight. Okay, so let me show you. So the U will be eight multiply X. So eight multiply 2.6, it will be 20.8, 20.8 centimeter. The V is eight Y, so eight into 7.8, and that will be 62.4 centimeter. So this is how you will find the U and the V value. I hope you understand what's the meaning of one ratio eight scale. It means on map or something is one centimeter. In actual, it is eight centimeter. Hopefully you understand. Okay, so the next part. Calculate the focal length F of the lens using the equation this, U, V divided by U plus V. So you just have to put this, the U and V value here, and you can calculate this by using the calculator. Okay, so let me show you. Okay. So uh, the U value is 20.8 and the V value is 62.4. Substitute those values here in this formula. So on your calculator, you will enter uh, 20.8 multiply 62.4 equals to divided bracket start 20.8 plus 62.4 bracket close 
equals to you will get 15.6 and when you round off it round it off to two decimal places 15.6 will be 16 centimeter it will be 16 centimeter okay so let's move to the next part he says state one precaution that the student takes to obtain an accurate value for the focal length f of the lens so you see move the screen very slowly to and fro to and fro to get the sharp the sharpest image you stop it where you get the sharpest image so do this process very slowly Another thing you can do is you can do this experiment in a room where there are no other lights. Only this light is switched on. So in the dark room, do this. So you can write many things. Okay, so just you have to answer here one. He says move screen slowly to and fro until sharpest focused image is obtained. So that is the... Okay, so we are done with the question number two. So let's go to the marking scheme. So here, so on your screen, you can see that the marking scheme of the question number two is showing up. Uh, pause the video and take your time to read this marking scheme, check your answers, check my answers, and make sure that you write the best possible answer. This is the marking scheme for the question number two. <clears throat> okay, so let's go to the next question. The next question is a student and her friend measure an approximate value for the speed of sound in air using echoes. She stands a large distance from a reflecting wall. She claps her hands at a regular rate. She adjusts her rate of clapping until each clap coincides with echo of the previous clap her friend and then uses a stopwatch to ensure the two sorry to measure the time t between claps they measure the distance to the wall the time uh, t between claps is recorded four times the value of the t measured in seconds are shown below so it's 0 0.87 0 0.97 0 0.94 0 0.88 seconds remember this word okay okay so um calculate the t average the average value of the t give your answer to two decimal places so t average you add up all four values and whatever the sum you get you divide that sum with four you get this is how you get the average let me show you my work. Okay. So 0 0.87 plus 0 0.97 plus 0 0.94 plus 0 0.88 equals to divided by 4 equals to you will get 0 0.92. So that P average is 0 0.92 seconds. Okay. So here we go. Then he says, suggest so why it is sensible to give T average to two decimal places. You can see the variation is large. The raw data varies. There's large variation in them. So that's why it's sensible to give the T average in two decimal places. So let me write, show you my answer. There is a large variation in the raw data. Okay, so that's why you wrote the number to two decimal places only. Not more than that. The distance S from the student to the wall is 130 meter. A meter rule is not an appropriate device for measuring this distance, 130 meter, this 130 meter. Suggest a device that can be used to measure this distance. We can use the measuring tape. We can use the measuring tape. So we can use the measuring tape, okay. Okay, the speed V of the sound in the air is given by the equation V is equals to 2S divided by T average, calculate the V. You just have to put the value of the S, which is 130 meter. You have to put the value of T average, which is 0 0.92, I think, 
zero point nine two seconds, and just put those values here, and you will be able to find out the speed of the sound. Okay, so two multiply one thirty divided by zero point nine two, and that will be two eighty two point six, two eighty two point six meter per second. Then they say. So just one reason why the value for the speed of sound in air measured by this method is only an approximate. So you see, uh, because uh, there can be many reasons. Uh, you see, uh, one reason can be that the distance they have measured is only an approximation. That's why the, our value is not that accurate. It's only an approximation. Okay, so uh, let me show you the next question. Okay, we are done with this. So uh, we'll look at the question number three marking scheme. Um, you can take your time, pause the video, have a, take your time to read the marking scheme for the question number three. The question number three B, third part, whose answer we wrote that the distance is only, only an approximation. There are other reasons also there, difficult to measure distance accurately, difficult to coordinate claps with the echoes, reaction time error. You can write one of the reasons. We have written that the distance was an approximation. Okay, so we are going to the next question. He says, a student uses a plotting compass to plot the pattern of the magnetic field between the north poles of the two bar magnets. The student places the magnets on a sheet of white paper as shown in the figure 4.1. So here we have a figure 4.1. So here you have a magnetic plotting compass. These are two bar magnets placed. North pole is facing the north pole. So we want to... Uh, for, draw the magnetic field line pattern here. So their question is, describe how the student uses the plotting compass to plot the pattern of the magnetic field. You may add on the figure 4.1 to help you explain your answer if you wish. It's a three mark question. So what we will do, we place the magnetic compass near the North Pole, wherever the pointer will point, I will put a dot on, uh, and uh, where the pointer will be pointing, I'll put a dot on the paper. Then I will take the, I will move the magnetic compass in uh, such a way that the back of the plotting compass pointer will be coinciding with that dot. And wherever the pointer will point, I'll put the second dot. And then I will move and I will continue doing this process until I reach the South Pole. Then I will start again at, on a different location near this North Pole and I will put dots, 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 and I will reach the South Pole. South Pole. Then I will join these dots with a smooth curve. I mean, with a curve, okay? So the curve will be starting from north and we're going to the south. And this way I can draw three, four curves and that will show you how the pattern is. So let me show you why I have done this question. Okay. So you can see here, I put a, I have shown that the magnetic lines will be coming from north going to the south. They will not intersect here. From this north, the lines will going out, going back going out and going back into this south. Here, there will be a gap, okay? Because the magnetic lines do not intersect each other. Here, we have shown the magnetic compasses, okay? So like this, you put a dot, then you put a dot here, then you put a dot here, then you put a dot here. Then you join these dots with the, with the curve. Okay, so uh, place magnetic compass near North Pole. Where pointer point, pointer of the magnetic compass points, put a dot on paper. Place magnetic compass such that you move the magnetic compass in such a way that the back of the pointer coincides with the previous dot and make a new dot. Continue doing this until South Pole is reached. Then join the dots with a curve. Then do this process again by starting from uh, another location near, near the North Pole. So, and then their question is state, what else the student can deduce about the magnetic field in this investigation? He can find out the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, so that's the B part. So by the B part, we have reached the end of this paper. So let, let's have a look at the magnetic, the 
Okay, so this is the marking scheme showing up on your screen. Pause the video and read this marking scheme. Check every mark that what you have to write to get the full marks. It is very important to read the marking scheme. So my dear students, um, we have done today, October, November, 2018, 4-2 paper. The paper we were doing was alternative to practical. We called it paper four. We also called it ATP. The syllabus we are studying is physics 5054. My name is Farhan Mazar, and it's a player for me to teach you online and to be some help to you. If you find this video helpful, if you find this video interesting and it's helping you to understand physics and it makes you to do this paper, please subscribe my channel. Also share the link of this video onto your Facebook accounts, into your Instagram accounts and onto your Twitter. That will be a great appreciation for me. So thank you very much. Have a good day and God bless you all.